What is Fisher information? Well, it's a way of measuring the information content in a set of measurements that you might make about a parameter. So let's think about an example. Let's think about the temperature in your stomach. And let's say that's the variable theta. And we'd like to measure that temperature. And we've got different ways of measuring the temperature in our stomach. One way, for example, might be to put a thermometer in our mouth. And so what we're going to do is measure a different parameter. It's not the temperature in the stomach, but it's a related parameter. So let's say in the mouth, there's a function of the temperature that's in your stomach, the core temperature of your body, let's say that. So that's theta. But it's also a function of other things like how much you had your mouth open. So uh, I'll put open here. So how much your mouth has been open, uh, maybe uh, whether you've had a warm drink recently. So I might put coffee here, for example, uh, and all sorts of other parameters go into measuring the amount of heat in your mouth and its relationship to the heat in your stomach. So this is a random variable that you'll be measuring in your mouth. It has randomness from these other inputs, but it also tells you something about the parameter of the temperature in your stomach. You could do other measurements as well. So let's think about another one. Maybe you put a thermometer under your arm. Uh, and then this would be a, another Thing that you could measure. It's going to be a different, I'll put U for under your arm here, for example. So it's a different function. It's also a function of your core body temperature in your stomach, uh, but it also depends on other things like the amount of exercise, for example. Um, uh, the amount of exercise you've done, perhaps the outside temperature as well. The, uh, so I'll put outside temperature here. So this is also going to be something which tells you about the temperature of your stomach, but it's also a random parameter because it's got these other elements that are random. So these are random numbers that you're going to be measuring if you do these measurements these ways. Another way you could do it is to swallow uh, one of these new advanced uh, pills and that pill will go into your stomach and it will measure your uh, stomach temperature much more accurately, but then for, there might be noise in the measurement. So I'm going to put uh, noise here because uh, getting the signal out from your stomach from that pill is a noisy process and you may not be able to uh, detect the value very accurately. So this will be another random variable. So we might have three different methods of measuring this parameter and we would like to know which of these methods is the best. Which of these methods, which of these variables we can measure, x, y, or z, which one contains the most information about the parameter that we can't observe directly? We, we can't measure this directly. We can only measure it by measuring other things which are random. And the Fisher information tells us about which of these carries the most information about that parameter. So that's an overall intuitive understanding of this Fisher information. Let's look at the actual formula for it. Here's the formula. So the Fisher information for the, let's just take this middle one, y, and we'll use that as an example. Uh, so the Fisher information, i for the, that random variable y, how much information does that contain about the parameter theta, is given by this definition. It's the expected value of the square, this is a squared function here, of the derivative of the log normal, the natural logarithm of the PDF of that random variable. Now that's quite a mouthful. So let's break this down and understand what this is. Before we do that, and before we understand the intuition, again, let's look at a bit more detail about this example. Okay, so here's this example where we've got the pill in the stomach. It's actually measuring the temperature in the stomach, but when we take the measurement, there's gonna be noise because the signal is noisy uh, when it gets transmitted out from the stomach. And that noise we're going to take to be a Gaussian distributed with zero mean and a variance sigma squared. So here's an equation for our measurement. It's a random variable because the noise is random, but the parameter is a fixed constant parameter that we're trying to measure. Okay, so in this case, because the noise is Gaussian distributed and because this is a constant, the distribution of our measurement will also be a Gaussian distribution. This, it will be a Gaussian distribution that looks like this. 
So it's a, so Y will be distributed Gaussian with a mean of theta and a variance of sigma squared. And so this is what I've drawn here. And this is the probability density function, which appears in this equation here for the Fisher information. And for more information about probability density functions, check out the description below this video where there's many more videos on the channel explaining a lot of these uh, statistical and probabilistic uh, terms and functions. So let's think about this one. It's a Gaussian shape centered on the parameter that we're trying to estimate. And what we need to do to work out the Fisher information is we need to take the, the natural logarithm, take the derivative with respect to theta, uh, square it and take the expected value. So let's uh, go through that now. And I think that you should be able to um, calculate that fairly straightforward. Here's the distribution. It's the Gaussian distribution, the well-known standard Gaussian distribution. And then we take the log of this, and I think you can see the log of this will, will have a term for this one here, and then uh, it, the log will cancel the exp, uh, exponential here. And then uh, you can take the derivative of that fairly straightforwardly to find that that equals y minus theta divided by sigma squared. Now we take the square of that and we take the expected value. Now what does that equal? I'll just show that extra step down here. So that's the expected value, this uh, sigma squared squared term on the bottom denominator comes out the front. And to do an expected value, you're integrating that value over the probability density function. And again, we've got videos on the channel about expected values. The important thing to note here is that this is the actual definition of the variance because it's y minus the mean. So the variable minus the mean squared uh, and the expected value of that is the variance. So this integral equals sigma squared. And so you get sigma squared on the top, sigma to the four on the bottom, and you get the answer one divided by sigma squared. So let's think, does this make sense for us? Well, I think that it does make sense. And let's think about what we're doing here. The information contained is inversely proportional to the variance of the noise. So let's think about two extreme cases. Let's think if the noise is very small. So if the noise in our measurement is very small, then when we're taking all these measurements, we'll mostly be seeing theta and with just some small perturbation. And so when we take these measurements intuitively, we will be learning a lot of information about theta. So when sigma squared is small, uh, we should be seeing the information is high. And help look over here, it's the inverse of a small number will be a big number. So that will have a lot of information. So that makes sense. What about the case when the noise is big? If this variance is large, then the noise will swamp the parameter. And when we're taking measurements of Y, mostly we will be measuring W. It will be swamping the parameter. And therefore, when we take those measurements, we won't be learning very much about the parameter theta. In this case, the temperature in the stomach in this example. And let's see that when sigma squared is large, then we've got an inverse of a large number, which is a small number. And sure enough, the Fisher information will be small. So intuitively, this, this makes sense. Uh, now let's try to understand this equation a bit more, really to intuitively understand the equation. In this example, it made sense, but what? why is it that we've got this uh, square, the derivative, the log of this probability density function? So let's try to think about that for a minute. Well, let's work from the inside out. Um, let's uh, ignore the log for a minute. We'll come back to that. And let's think about this derivative. Why are we looking at the derivative of the probability density function? Well, what that means is that we are looking at the change in this function as theta changes, so for different values of theta. So let's think what we're doing. We're learning, when we're taking measurements y, these random variable measurements, we can, over time, we could build up a histogram that enables us to learn this probability density function shape. So every time we take a value of y, we could store it, another value, another value, another value, and then we could draw a histogram. The histogram would have a shape, uh, if you took enough measurements, it would have the shape that matches the probability density function. And what we'd be asking ourselves is, once we've done that for a particular value of theta, and we've, we've learnt this histogram, uh, how much does that tell us about the theta? For example, 
would the histogram change if theta changed? And if the histogram doesn't change when theta changes, then we haven't learned very much about theta because a lot of different theta values could all match up with the histogram that we had measured. And so we wouldn't be able to say what, which actual value of theta was the one that was the one we're looking for. In this case, the temperature of the stomach. If lots of different temperatures of the stomach had very similar histograms, then we are not learning very much about the temperature of the stomach or the parameter in more generally. So therefore we are interested in how this function changes with respect to theta. So if the function changes a lot, the histogram changes a lot, then if you've measured a particular histogram, then it would be quite different to a histogram for a different temperature and therefore different parameter. And therefore you would have learned, you'd be very accurately able to say, no, this is the histogram we learned. It matches up with that parameter. And we're confident it's not matching up with any other parameters and therefore you've got a good estimate. You've learned a lot of information. So therefore, that's why we're interested in the derivative of the function with respect to the parameter. What about this log function? Well, let's think about what's happening outside. It will help us to understand why there's a log. We're doing an expected value. And that's because this probability density function has many values, of course, it's a function of y, but we want one number that characterizes the information. So that's why we're looking at the expected value. When we're doing an expected value, as we see down here, it involves an integral. That means summing up over all the values of y. So we are going to sum up the change in the function over all the values of y. The this expectation is over the randomness. The randomness is in y coming from the noise, not coming from the parameter, because that's constant. So, okay, so then we, we're going to be adding all of this up over all the values of y. And what we can see is, if we're looking at the changes in, if we, are, if we didn't have the log here, and we're looking at the changes in this function, the changes will be bigger where the function is bigger. And so for the same percentage change all over, you would have bigger actual changes, um, absolute changes where the function is bigger. And when you do the expectation, you're adding up over all the values, those values would swamp all the other values. But we're interested in all of the values. So what this log function does is it actually enhances the small values so that we can, when we look at the change in the values, we're going to have an, a much more contribution to the overall information from these small values, when the small values are. So all of these values of y will contribute to the information, not just be swamped by the changes that happen around when the value of the function itself is big. And why is that? Let's look at the log function. So here's the log function over here. And this is the, the, uh, the input to the log function. And this is the output of the log function. It has this particular shape here. So what we can see is for values that are bigger than one, those values of alpha up here, they are going to be coming out of the log function at a smaller value, suppressed, because that's less than the 45 degree line. So in this direction here, all of these values that go into our log function are going to be suppressed. Um, and all of these values between zero and one, the small values, these values out here, these values are going to be amplified. And these, this is, okay, it's negatively amplified, but that's why we've got the square here. So all of the small values here of our function, when, we, when they go through the log, they are going to be amplified in a negative way, but then we take the square of that and we're going to have a positive effect, which boosts up the changes in the areas of the probability density function, which are small valued. So that's why we've got the log function there. There's other reasons as well. The log makes it easy to do some of these calculations because for example, with a Gaussian, there's an exponential and it's good to have a log there. Um, but more fundamentally for the information, it's about trying to get a measure which includes the changes across the entire base of the probability density function. That's why the log is important. So let's look at some actual realizations of this and some examples to get even more insights. Here we have five plots and the first plot is the probability density function. 
where the parameter equals 1 and the standard deviation equals 0 0.5. So the variance equals 0.25 and the Fisher information equals 4. And let's look at the different plots. The second plot is the log of that function. The third plot, the derivative of that log. The fourth one is the square of that. And the bottom plot is the term inside the expectation integral. So down here, it's this term here inside this integral. And what I'm showing now is the case when theta equals 2. And in this case, we can see quite a bit of change in the PDF. Uh, we can see that the values at the bottom and the bottom plot have shifted across, but the area is the same. So we've got a different value of theta, but the information is the same because this random variable is measuring that in the same way with the same noise. So the information is the same. And what we can see here is that the PDFs have changed quite a bit for this value of standard deviation, and that corresponds to the uh, Fisher information being of level four. And just notice the height of the bottom plot uh, goes from zero to about 2.5. I'm now going to show when the variance of the noise is bigger. So now we have a standard deviation equals 2, which means the variance equals 4. And now the Fisher information equals 1 quarter. And you can see on the bottom plot, the scale is only to 0 0.03. So the scale is these are much smaller values inside the expectation now. And you can see it's a wider PDF at the top. And now when we show the PDF for theta equals 2, we can see that these two PDFs look very similar. And so by measuring in this level of noise, you wouldn't be getting as much information about the parameter theta because the, you'd be measuring the PDFs, you'd be measuring the random variables means measuring the PDFs, and you, they, they look so similar that you can't be certain about the value of theta anymore. And that reflects itself in the smaller value of the Fisher information. I'm now showing a case where the noise is much smaller and we have a much narrower PDF. And as I move through and show different uh, plots, the different colors are for more noise as the standard deviation of the noise increases. And what you can see is that the curve at the bottom is now getting broader and lower. So that is reflecting when you integrate over the, uh, add up the area, which is performing that expectation of the bottom plot, you're getting less area and therefore the information is less. So as the, uh, so as the standard deviation increases, the Fisher information reduces. And now if we look at the middle curves, we can see the effect of the log function quite clearly. In particular, on the second curve, we're seeing that the very small, the values that are very small in the PDF are now enhanced under the log. And when we look at the change with respect to theta in the third plot, we are seeing that we're getting an enhancement of that change so that all of those components are now contributing when we sum them up across all the values when we do the expectation. And so this is really showing the effect of that log function in the Fisher information. So if this video has helped you to understand Fisher information, uh, please give it a thumbs up, it helps others to find the video. Uh, check out the description below the video where there's a full categorized listing on the web page associated with the channel. And of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos.